Hello. <laughs> I'm going to talk to you today about Creole languages. And some of the elements of my talk will include uh, the language acquisition theories of Noam Chomsky and Derek Bickerton, how children acquire their mother tongue, how pidgin languages are born, how Creole languages are born, how colonizers treat indigenous languages. And I'm also going to talk about the French education system in Francophone Africa. I refer to it as Francophonie, Francophobie. Okay, the first section, I talk about how a child learns a pidgin language, a Creole language, or any other natural language. I'll present the linguistic theories available to us with regard to the innate linguistic capacities children have and how children use them to acquire languages, whether living in a natural language environment or a natural Creole language environment or in a pidgin environment. I hope to compare the difference between how they acquire their maternal languages in contrast with how a child may become a speaker of a Creole language whether the language is spoken by the child's parents or not. Theoretically, I will present the child language acquisition theory of Professor Noam Chomsky, as I understand it, and also the bioprogram hypothesis of Creolist linguist, Derek Bickerton. You will learn how he explains the way children become native speakers of Creole languages and how we come to understand what a natural language is as opposed to an unnatural language. Bickerton informs us that the structures of most Creole languages resemble one another. And I will present a summary of the grammatical structures of Creoles. Then I hope to pursue certain aspects of languages in education in countries where a colonial language has historically been imposed as the medium of instruction in education and to examine efforts that have been made in certain countries to establish a maternal language based curriculum in the education system. This will lead me to a discussion also of bilingual education as it was practiced in the United States, though unfortunately terminated during President Ronald Reagan's administration. Myself as an Africanist linguist, I helped establish a program of African language instruction at Boston University in 1980. And I also taught several of the languages offered there. Even though two of the many African countries I have frequented, Mali and Niger, have dozens of languages, this is an example for you, they each have one important language which is spread and is understood and shared by nearly their entire population. In the case of Mali, it's Bamanankan or Bambara. And in the case of Niger or Niger, it's the Hausa language. I learned both of these languages well while working for the Peace Corps and began teaching them at Boston University starting in 1980. Though both of these countries are former French colonies, nevertheless, in terms of the education system, it would make obvious sense that one would want to use Bamanankan and Hausa as medium of instruction in their respective countries. Though it may seem obvious to us, the French colonizer has never really opened the door for an African language to be used as a widespread medium of instruction in an education system. The French like to control the choice of the medium of instruction and also the textbook and publishing market and even the educational testing in their former colonies. So how do children acquire their maternal languages? According to the theoretical linguistic work of Noam Chomsky, children come into the world equipped with the capacity to acquire their parents' language provided that it is a natural language through contact with their family and their playmates. How do they do it? Chomsky indicates a child's brain has something like grammatically driven toggle switches. And as the child is increasingly ex exposed to language, 
he or she figures out what kind of a language they are dealing with by flipping the switches as they discover rules. Whether it is agglutinative, fusional, synthetic, or isolating, and connected with those features also the word order typology of the language. Sets of features accompany each of these types of language and their word order typologies. They thereby discover how the language organizes meaningful elements or morphemes. For example, if exposed to a subject, direct object, verb language, we call it an SOV language. <clears throat> The child is programmed to know how to handle that and to have the knowledge that function marking of subject and direct objects will be necessary. Since very often a subject object verb, verb language may also produce object subject verb sentences as an alternative and thus object and subject must be marked for their function to avoid any ambiguity. As the child progresses in the acquisition process, he or she flips the various toggle switches along the way as the language structure is revealed. The child also knows how to try sentences and learn from the response, whether they have it right or if they have to make an adjustment to their understanding. This is a rather basic summary of a very complex theory explaining child language acquisition. Now I'm looking at uh, Creole languages that were taught in bilingual education in the Boston area. Transitional bilingual education did thrive for a certain period of time in the US up until President Ronald Reagan came on the scene. After my arrival in Boston, I soon discovered in the bilingual education curriculum, I soon discovered two diaspora communities whose languages were being used as medium of instruction in the bilingual education curriculum of the Boston area, right in my neighborhood. Haitian or Haitian Creole was the initial medium of instruction for Haitian immigrant children in Cambridge and Cape Verdean Creole for Cape Verdean immigrant children in the bilingual education programs of Roxbury and Dorchester. Now, when I began teaching Hausa at Boston University, one of my first students was Juan Jose Rodriguez Pires, a theater major, originally from Praia in the Cape Verde Islands off the coast of Senegal. We got along well, and he decided very early in the semester that as he said to me, if you're going to teach me the Hausa language, then I'm going to teach you to speak my maternal language, Creole. I agreed. He made great progress in Hausa and, in, and I in Creole, since the structure of Creole reminded me of the structure of other African languages that I knew. And I found myself learning it rather quickly. I also began to volunteer one or two nights a week at a Haitian literacy center. And there I also availed myself of the opportunity to learn Haitian through teaching literacy. And I was surprised to discover similar grammatical structures in Haitian and Cape Verdean Creole. There I met Josiane Udicor Barnes, who was a Haitian immigrant and Haitian uh, medium bilingual edu education teacher in the Cambridge school system. Before long, I began visiting her classes and learned a lot about their language. Within my first two years in Boston, we had published with my Cape Verdean student, a small Creole English dictionary, Creolu, of Cape Verdean Creolu, Another year later, Josiane Barnes and I had obtained a US Department of Education grant and began working on a reference grammar of Haitian. It turns out that nearly all Creole languages share similar linguistic structures. So I want to look at those together.
So now, looking at the morphological typology of languages, in general, they can be agglutinative, as I said earlier, fusional, synthetic, or isolating in terms of the morphological typology of their grammar, or some combination of these four features. A morpheme, the key element of morphology, is the smallest meaningful and indivisible element in a language. Morphology is how morphemes are organized. Now, agglutinative languages combine morphemes together in a morphologically segmentable word, as in the Swahili sentence, the key Swahili sentence that I have provided you. And you will get to look at a copy of this paper. <laughs> okay, I put hyphens between all of the morpheme boundaries. So the sentence in Kiswahili is tutaunana kesho. Tutaunana, you can tell it's one word because you stress the next to the last syllable. Tutaunana kesho, and kesho is one word because you stress the next to the last syllable, a. This means we shall see one another tomorrow. So those four morphemes, tuta o nana, constitute almost a complete sentence, meaning we shall see one another. Tu, and they can be segmented, as I said, in a agglutinative language. Tu means we, ta means the future, ona means the verb to see, and the na after that means reciprocity. So we're, we see one another. So everybody repeat, tutaunana kesho. We can also have fusional languages, which fuse morphemes together into one word, which is not necessarily segmentable. English has some fusional features, but also some of the other categories. If we look at the word go versus the word went. We know that both of them have the meaning of the verb go in them, but we can't take the word went and cut it in two and say the we means go and the nt means the past tense. It doesn't work. So those two morphemes are fused into the word went, go and the past tense. Also eat and ate. Eat is simply one morpheme, the verb eat, and eight has the meaning eat plus the past tense also. But we can't divide eight, it's not segmentable, so it's fused and fusional. The third group is called a synthetic language, which brings all morphemes of a sentence into one long word. It synthesizes them all so that a sentence is made up of one word. Okay, so this is from a language called Chukchi of Siberia. And I will try to pronounce this one sentence. To my no left to puv turken. To my no left to puv turken. Think of that as all one word. It means I have a fierce headache. <laughs> okay. So it's a complete sentence made up of one long word, synthetic. Isolating languages have only one meaningful element or morpheme per word. So there's nothing to segment or divide up. Here is a sample sentence from Haitian Creole, where each word has only one morpheme. Mpakap manger tout pomme là. Mpakap manger tout pomme là. I'm not able to eat all of the apple. M is me. Pa is not negative. Cup, be capable. Manger, eat. Tout, entire or all. Pomme, apple, and la. La is the definite article. Mpakap manger tout pomme la. Repeat. Okay. Here's another one. Mvle yon pati nan fi fei banan la. Mvle 
yung pati ng fai bananla. Mm is me again, vle, I want. Yung pati, two words, one part. Nang, an article. Fai is leaf and banan is banana. And lang is an, again a definite article. Vle yung pati na fai banana. Bananla. Most Creole languages share the features of isolating languages with normally one morpheme per word. They may not have ways to combine morphemes, nor do they have tense markers and other inflectional markers connected to a verb in one word, but they instead tend to have short one morpheme words. Tense markers, for example, are separate particles Plural markers can be a separate word as well. So all lexical and grammatical morphemes tend to have a singular realization and remain separate. Just like we saw in those sentences. <clears throat> now, in terms of word order typology, languages have a, a, a variety of possible orders, which are, for example, subject, verb, odd, uh, direct object, like English has a lot of sentences like that. Subject, direct, object, verb. Uh, the Japanese languages have, have sentences like that. With the verb at the very end. Uh, direct object, subject, verb also is possible, OSV. And also verb initial, verb, subject, direct object, VSO. So whenever you have both nouns on one side of a verb, you, since, since both orders are possible, you have to be sure that you know the function of it. So sometimes a language will put case markers on it, just like people do in German and other languages that you may have studied. Case indicates function. Creole languages are mostly subject verb object languages since they do not have a way to mark noun phrases by adding prefixed or suffixed case or function markers to the subject and the direct object. So Creole languages are quite strict in their word order. So you'll always know what noun you're dealing with. So without case marking, they're obliged to have the strict word order in order for one to understand which noun phrase is the subject, which the direct object, as in as I said, German and Latin also. Creole languages are historically constituted of one or more super straight languages and one or more substrate languages. Pidgin and Creole languages are the products of emigration, immigration, and displacement of populations resulting from historical movements like colonization and the transportation of human subjects. French, Japanese, and Portuguese, for example, are three typical super straight languages of societies where these kinds of movements of people have occurred, and also colonizer languages. And a broad range of languages serve as substrate languages, depending upon the geographical content context in which a Creole language has come into being. Colonialism involving the occupation by the colonizer may result in a contact situation with local languages that result in a pidgin language. So a pidgin is the simplified means of communication that develops between, between two or more groups of people that do not have a language in common. Its vocabulary and grammar may be limited and variable and often drawn from several different languages. From Derek Bickerton, we learn that a pidgin language does not have native speakers. Why? Because the different language backgrounds of their speech community may come from different countries and often involve adults who have their own maternal language and may change depending upon the proportions of people and their languages from the host country and the numbers of immigrants 
and languages from each contributing country. So you need to remember that a pidgin language is, happens when two communities come together that don't have a common language and how the structures of pigeons can vary as they evolve. Over time, the relative proportions of the various contributing language groups may vary, and that can alter the evolution <clears throat> of the pidgin language that has been developed. As the speakers of the superstrate language become fewer, and the numbers of the substrate groups of speakers become more numerous and perhaps more varied, then there's an increased possibility for the Creole language to emerge and a greater need for a common language. A Creole is a stable natural language, okay? Which develops from the simplifying and mixing of different languages into a new one within a fairly brief time period. Now, how does this happen? Children are in charge here. Using the toggle, toggle switches in their minds and their ability to acquire language naturally, the children take the unnatural pidgin language as input and through their own process of acquisition, they transform the input from a pidgin into a Creole language, which is a natural one, producing a natural language. They are endowed with the innate ability to transform pidgin input into a natural Creole language. This is remarkable. They transform it into a language with grammatical rules that are thereby acquirable. So a natural language has rules that are acquirable. Bickerton's theory of Creolization of a pigeon referred to what he calls the bioprogram hypothesis. According to him, the fact that Creoles share a similar structure with other Creoles is due to the fact that Creole structures are reflections of a child innate grammatical bioprogram. Whereas a child under normal circumstances is able to acquire a language in the home environment and with playmates, that child adapts the same acquisition, acquisition skills in the face of an unnatural language like a pigeon. <clears throat> a generation of children has the ability to transform the pigeon into a Creole. This I find remarkable. And the, and the Creole is a natural language through the application of their bio program. Having become a natural language for subsequent generations, the Creole will be acquired naturally and its structures will have become stable. It is this process of transforming an unnatural pigeon into a natural Creole that results in the shared structures that are typical of Creole languages, exemplary of the child's bio program. Remarkably, numerous Creoles with a French superstrate, though thousands of miles apart, are found to be mutually intelligible with one another. This is true of Portuguese superstrate languages also, like Cape Verdean Creole. Criolu of the Cape Verde Islands off the coast of Senegal in West Africa, and Papiamentu, for example, a Caribbean Creole language. They can communicate with each other even though evolved, they evolved so far away from one another. Similarly, Haitian Creole, Seychelles Creole, Réunion Creole, and Mauricien Creole, all sharing the French superstrate are basically mutually intelligible. When I met Elsa, we began speaking immediately, I in Haitian and she in, in Mauritian. We could understand each other fairly well. She was better than me, but. Now I'm gonna talk about language discrimination and prejudice. In spite of the hard fought battle to become a natural language that pidgin languages undergo, nevertheless, the resulting Creoles are often victims of linguistic and cultural discrimination. In environments where Europeans have come to occupy countries that they have colonized or come to occupy through some other event, there is inevitably imperial, social, 
cultural and linguistic discrimination against the indigenous population whose learning of the col colonial language is not satisfactory to the colonizers. In the face of the French colonizer in Francophone Africa, where I spent a long part of my life, and in the Caribbean, the local languages of the population, whether indigenous or a more recent Creole, are simply not good enough and not worth it in the eyes of the colonizer. By the end of the 18th century, many of those who spoke French were extremely proud of their language. It was no longer felt necessary to defend and illustrate it. In 1784, Antoine de Rivarol won a prize offered by the Berlin Academy for his speech on the universality of the French language, Discours sur l'universalité de la langue française, in which he glorified the language and its virtues, a language too, which after the Treaty of Rastat of 1714 had become the language of international diplomacy. Some of his words are worth quoting here because they illustrate an attitude toward the French language that one still finds, making it difficult for many obliged to use French to set any high value on their own languages. He said, there has never been a language in which you could write more purely and more precisely than in ours, which is more resistant to equivocation and every kind of obscurity, more serious and more gentle at the same time, more suitable for all kinds of styles, purer in its phrases, more judicious in its expressions, which has a greater liking for elegance and ornament, but which is more fearful of affectation it knows how to moderate its strength with the modesty and restraint it must have in order to avoid the monstrous expressions in which our neighbors today are fixed. There is none among them which is more attentive to number and rhythm in its declaration, which is the true mark of perfection in languages. So we can see how those attitudes in the case of the French would impact their contact with the speakers of the indigenous languages and Creoles in their colonies, even today in their foreign colonies, in their former colonies, excuse me. Montaigne wrote about 500 years ago that a child is not a vase that one fills up, but a fire that one lights up. The French language in Francophone Africa according to myself, ends up being the water that puts out the child's fire. After the French Revolution, the revolutionaries had to ignore the fiction that French was spoken everywhere in France. Not so. The French were indeed establishing the precedent of pretending to be linguistically unified by imposing the French language and using it in all official declarations. The feelings of inferiority over their language felt by the Haitian people and African peoples are rooted in their colonial experience. To this day, one encounters Haitian immigrants who deny that they speak Haitian, latching on to Francophonie as their claim to a leg legitimate linguistic and cultural identity. France's colonial policy can be interpreted as a reflex of the tenuous and oversensitive feelings the French had about their language at the time that they became fully engaged in their colonial enterprise. Historically speaking, French has not been the language of all French people within the, the hexagon for that long. In truth, by the end of the 18th century, about half the population of France still had little or no knowledge of French. In fact, French had endured the same kind of systemic discrimination that we observe today against Creoles, pigeons, and minority languages like African and Native American languages and those who speak them. This reflects the French attitude toward the European languages spoken within her borders and surrounding her. Her attitude toward Creole languages or patois has historically been more disdainful than that expressed above but it became clear that what was good for France was also good for her overseas territories. Under the Third Republic, the school laws of Jules Ferry made primary education in French 
obligatory from 1886 and encouraged the promotion of French language and culture. The result was that the influence of Paris with its strong centralizing tendencies could be felt promptly and consistently everywhere within the hexagon. These were formative years for French identity and promotion of, French, of the French language. During the course of the 19th and well into the 20th century, it was absolutely forbidden to use any other language than French for purposes of instruction in the schools of France. It did not matter what language the children spoke, Flemish, German, Cat Catalan, Breton, etc. all were inferior to French. All that was just being firmly established in France was of course immediately applied to the colonial education system. France's civilizing mission was designed to regenerate the savages and civilize them. The French language and culture were part and parcel of the French elite during the French colonial period and have remained so for the Haitian elite as an exclusivist tool for retaining their power. There was no interest in Haiti's own cultural and linguistic policy. In 1988, the new military ruler went immediately to the state-run television and addressed the nation in the French language. As in most of France's former colonies, the French rarely taught, failed to inculcate some part of the population so as to replace them after independence, <clears throat> i.e. to retain the role of the elitist French language and culture as a tool for excluding the population from participation in government. In his important book, Decolonizing the Mind, Kenyan author Ngugi Wationgo has stressed the point that all that has been written by actual and former colonial subjects in colonial languages has indeed enhanced those languages. This enhancement could as well have impacted their own languages were the same energy spent on their own languages. But it was all towards the colonial languages. Though the French tend to look down their nose at the uses to which their language is put by Francophone authors from outside of the hexagon, they in fact appropriate the use of their language in this role. A Haitian author who had left Haiti in the 1940s, uh, René Dupestre, was awarded the French Prix Renaudot in 1988 for a novel he had written. When interviewed by Radio Canada, Dupestre indicated his strong ties to France and by stating, all of us, by some area of our sensitivity, our language and our culture, we belong to Europe. The sensitivity of this issue among Haitians was evidenced by a reaction to the interview which appeared in Haiti in, in uh, 1988. Now I wanna talk about attitudes towards the Haitian language, Creole versus colonial language. From time immemorial, few authors have been able to approach and analyze Haitian on its own terms. Both Haitian and non-Haitian authors have great difficulty describing this language without referring contrastively to French. In many cases, the contrasting is done almost apologetically. Even as recently as uh, the work of Phillips in 1987, she presents the grammar of Haitian point by point as it contrasts with French, with the description of French grammar usually presented first. She writes that Haitian syntax is contrasted with French because of its label as one of the French Creoles, its misnomer as a bastardized form of French and because some researchers have even classified it as a Romance language. If a Frenchman were to describe a French Creole, this is certainly the way in which he would proceed using what he might call, what we might call the have and the have not approach to Creole linguistics. French has this, but Haitian Creole does not have it. This results in a negative view of a Creole. 
Today, most linguists know that there is nothing deficient or unnatural about a natural language that relies totally on word order and syntactic configuration to indicate the grammatical function of lexical categories that are not distinguished by the inflectional and derivational morphology of the language. The lay reader frequently sees this approach as proof that the Creole language represents an impoverished version of the colonial language or a substandard dialect of the colonial language. If Haitian is going to survive in any form, written or not, then Haitians and non-Haitians alike must begin to see it on its own terms, not apologetically as a language without the grammatical characteristics of French. Today we know better. Creole languages exist independently of their superstrate and their substrate languages. Indeed, the Francophone literature treating the French-based Creoles is especially in recent years, particularly preoccupied with the idea of decreolization or returning to French, as if the French were in a hurry to see the decreolization of these languages and the subsequent <laughs> choice of French. I'm now gonna talk about the French language in the education system of a West African country, Burkina Faso, used to be Upper Volta. Reality is seen in practice. In spite of enormous investments, the Burkina Faso Ministry of Education in 1995 reported about their education system. Burkina Faso is a country where the education level is one of the weakest. This paradox explains itself by the high unitary costs, not only at the primary, but also at the secondary and higher education levels. Access to basic education remains weak and unequal. For the school year 1993, among a school age population estimated at 1,774,000, only 562,644 pupils were schooled, that is only 32.93% of school age children. According to the same document, inequalities between rural and urban zones, between provinces and between girls and boys remain flagrant. In this highly selective system, in 1991-92, the elevated level of resitters <clears throat> greatly reduced the capacity of the system to take on more school aged children with 1,517 classrooms and teachers being necessary to take care of the resitters alone. Now I wanna talk about the curriculum used in these schools, these primary schools in Burkina Faso and the predominance of the French language. In a table that I present, which you will have access to, <clears throat> if we add up all of the, the classroom hours that are taught during an entire year, of the six different grades in the official curriculum, out of those 180 hours, 100 of those hours are dedicated to the learning of the French language. A high percentage of children are deselected from this system and are left alienated from their home environment while being judged unfit for the modern sector. This is very sad. Displaced and unemployed youth have become a major problem in urban areas in Francophone Africa. And the school system only exacerbates this problem. The exclu exclusivity of this system has no apparent redeeming, redeeming feature. It excludes the majority of the population, rejects a high percentage of the rest of the population, and excludes all local learning systems and their languages and cultures. Efforts to Africanize the French school curriculum have been carried out historically 
changing the content of certain subject areas in the curriculum, etc. But the net result has been nothing more than the alleged Africanization of the curriculum, which is still based in a foreign vision of education. Now I want to talk about one of my favorite topics, which is la dictée, or dictation, and the role it plays in this primary school of Burkina Faso that we are talking about. French is not only an extremely difficult language for the African child to learn to speak, but when it comes to writing, the problems and challenges facing the child increase geometrically. The French system is quite taken by French orthography. The French think the writing system is really cool. They're obsessed even. And indeed, writing and spelling constitute a major preoccupation in the French language curriculum. In the non-French subjects as well, since French is still the medium, <clears throat> the form achieved by the child is frequently deemed more important than the content. That is, grading is based more on the correctness of the French than the correctness of the content. The poor child coming out of this system is not necessarily a good French reader with a tenuous knowledge of French reading and writing. Ironically, for the French, their system does not create an increase in the reading population adequate to satisfy the book publishers of France. So I'm still gonna talk more about the dictée. Joseph Pott, who's a French specialist on education in Africa, discussing French orthography, shows how to make the transition from the African child's maternal language to French in a transitional bilingual education program. He explains, for example, that when the child has identified the sound eh, like we have in the, the English word bet, for example, B-E-T, there's an eh in the middle. Phonetically, it's called an open E, just two half circles on top of each other. So if the child has identified that, he can then inventory in a text the following graphemes, which, are, which, you, which I will share with you, which are all transcriptions of one and the same phoneme. So if the child were learning to read and write in his own language, for these 10 different forms that appear in French, there would only be one vowel that the child would have to learn, eh simple. In the French writing system, that same sound can be written A-I-E-N-T, eh, as in the word ils étaient, étaient, eh, in the word étaient, eh, in the word <clears throat> la plaine, eh, eh, in la terre, eh, in la tête, some of these have accents, others don't. The poor child has to learn all of them. A with an accent grave in le modèle. A circumflex over the E in the word l'arrêt, the, the stop. The word queen. A also la reine. And the word hatred. E, la e. And I thought of another one. AIS also, another way that the child has that actually can Javé. Imagine this the pedagogical priority to have a child who may hardly speak the language in question examine a text looking for the nine or ten different orthographic renditions of the same single sound. What education system can afford this form of absurdity? This is how many children get deselected from the school. Not to mention the system with very limited, in school systems that have very limited financial resources. The French are obviously very proud of their spelling system. They take pride in having a selective education system, 
and have historically rejected suggestions to reform it, to make it simpler. That is their decision. But is it fair that this vain and challenging system should become the evaluation metric for generations of non-French African children? It is this writing system which is the root cause of so many children being rejected from the system. What relevance does mastery of this writing system have, to have for Africa? With resitting or repeating a year more common than not, this is a costly system. For African children in the classical French school, dictation is the Waterloo subject for even the best of them. It is the primary cause of resitting and failure in the system. Dictation is the only exam subject on which a child can receive a negative score less than zero. All of the worst of this system is contained in the dictation, which requires memorization of the complex French orthography. And for what purpose? For French vanity and elitism. Next, I present another chart which shows uh, the grades of children, grades one through three, and, and uh, compares their results. And it shows how the dictate or the dictation is the thing that takes them all down. You'll be able to see this when you get a chance to look at the hard copy of this paper. So <clears throat> I'm, not gonna, I'm not gonna read all of those. Some of the children have never received the average required of five out of 10 in the dictation throughout the entire system. So if even the very best pupils can barely achieve a passing grade on the dictation, isn't there cause to re-examine not only the curriculum but also the entire system? From one school in Ouagadougou, the capital of Burkina Faso, where one has come to expect the best academic results are presented in the following table, the grades for the second trimester of the school year 1998-99 in grades two through six. <laughs> French language subjects are shown among are those that are in bold characters, the subjects with the worst grades or the highest failure rate. Again, you'll be able to look at this. The failure rate for the dictation, I'm sorry, I can't leave this subject alone, rises geometrically the length of the system to reach 100% in the C CM2, CM2, or sixth grade. One interpretation of these facts is that the system condones the low dictation performance of children early in the primary cycle, but then becomes stricter as the child approaches the point where it is determined whether he or she continues on to the next level. The system becomes most selective at this point. Children then discover that their level of performance is inadequate and they are eliminated. How cruel, ruthless, and what a waste. Mm -hmm. These observations are further corroborated when examining the reset rates of, of Burkina Faso pupils. And there again, I, I present you with charts. The failure rate for the dictation <laughs> rises geometrically the length of the system to reach 100% in the sixth grade when looking at the entire country. Now I wanna talk about the cost versus the benefit of the mastery of French. Where are the benefits accruing once this language is learned, once memorized, once mastered? Is the cost to children counterbalanced by advantages? How can we appraise the costs of the French school? Is education which critically evaluates the African child at every stage equitable and just? In this system which determines the child's success or failure based on knowledge of the many different orth orthographic representations of the same sounds, is it worthwhile to make children repeat one, two, three, even four years because they have not mastered the orthography as well as their counterpart in France? 
they are taking the same school leaving exams as, as children in France are, native speakers. Is this the optional, the optimal investment of human and monetary resources for a developing country? Yes, the evaluation, the evaluations are the same as those for French school children. These are the important questions. The fact that the French persist in imposing the same standards in Africa as in France constitutes little more than narcissistic vanity at the expense of the future of the African child. In section nine above, I quoted the work of Joseph Pott on the transition from language one to language two for a child initiated first in the maternal language before learning French. He's concerned there about the difficulties of the French writing system. In his view, the first language of the child is nothing more than a springboard to learning French. Moreover, learning French as soon as possible. French is introduced in his proposal after the first trimester of school. But learning to write in one's own language is not done simply to facilitate the transition of the orthography to the orthography of French. Its principal role is for L1 to be the medium for the acquisition of most of the curriculum, i.e. learning in one's own language facilitates the learning of curricular content, learning a foreign language does not. A foreign language cannot very soon become the vehicle for the learning of content. It can only be studied, memorized, learned, but cannot be a medium for content until much later in the system. Francophone Africa is one of the few remaining places where the child's language is totally excluded and all learning takes place in a foreign language. Joseph Pott suggests two essential prerequisites before beginning reading in the foreign language. The first condition is that the child know already how to read in his or her, his or her own language, or at the very least, that the technique of deciphering that language be familiar. The second condition for passage to the written word in the foreign language is that the child be already familiarized with the oral practice of this language. In the model that Pope proposes, the maternal language is eventually abandoned to sacrifice all for French and to prepare the child for the battery of exams to be faced throughout the system. This is sad. Now we have reached section 12 and my conclusion. The problem of reestablishing the hegemony of the beliefs and values of the population in, in one of these education systems is not a problem that is unique to education. In an editorial by Norbert Zongo, the late editor of the Burkina Faso newspaper, L'Independent, he addresses the same problem in relation to African cinema. Ouagadougou is the seat of a very famous uh, African cinema contest every year. He writes in this regard, African cinema developed and perfected the technique of the outheld hand, the illusion of not existing except in relation to the former colonial master. He's, he goes on, if our cinema is to enter into history, it must rid itself of its histories, its stories. The worst of all is its tutelary identification. Our cinema must cease to be an Anglophone or a Francophone cinema. It must know to break the barriers established by others to free itself from the cultural handcuffs which indenture it. It will be African or it will not be. The worst of all the tutelary cultural constraints is this story of ancien combattants or old soldiers, which is <clears throat> la francophonie. As African wisdom advises, avoid reliance on em emptiness. Our cinema will not enter history when encumbered by the pitiful history of colonization and the fragmentation of its continent. So this warning does not apply uniquely to cinema. 
in nearly all sectors of society in Francophone Africa, analogous situations exist in politics, in the economy, in the entire society, and especially in education. One might say that it is in some ways analogous to everything that has systematically turned against people of color that we are today encountering in American society. Thus, in education as well, one must avoid relying on that which is empty and void. I now turn to Haitian Creole for two wonderful proverbs that are very appropriate for my conclusion. In Haitian Creole, one pro proverb states, sac vide pa kembe, which is to say, an empty sack cannot hold itself up. I'll leave the interpretation up to you. Another Haitian proverb, which I love, says, Parle français, pas dit l'esprit pour ça, non. Repeat, parle français, pas dit l'esprit pour ça, non. Which means, just because you can speak French doesn't make you intelligent. On that attack of the Francophonie, I will close my presentation. Thank you.